Welcome to China Forum, where leading experts discuss important topics regarding China and the U.S.-China relationship. We are continuing our series, China Forum, Conversations with Ambassadors. Understanding your past diplomatic relationship with China and learning lessons from the diplomats who helped shape it are vital for ensuring strong diplomacy and effective China policy in the future. Today, we have the pleasure of being joined by Ambassador Jay Stapleton Roy. Ambassador Roy is the founding director emeritus and distinguished scholar at the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. From watching the Chinese Civil War from the roof of his school to, to participating in the secret negotiations to establish US PRC diplomatic relations, to serving as Assistant Secretary of State for Intelligence and Research, Ambassador Roy has lived through, navigated, and studied the development of China and modern Asia for more than 70 years. Holding the rank of career ambassador, he has served as the top U.S. envoy to Singapore, China, and Indonesia. A fluent Mandarin speaker, Roy is widely quoted on political developments in China and East Asia. Welcome, Ambassador Roy. Thank you. Nice to join you. It's great to have you. Before we discuss your career, can you talk a bit about your childhood, much of which was spent in China? Okay, it's a, uh, a long topic since I've spent a, a lot of time there. Of course. As a child, I lived in China during much of the Second Sino-Japanese War, which began in 1937 and extended on to 1935. Uh, my family returned to China in 1938, and we were there until 1945. As, as a teenager in China, later on, I witnessed the final stages of the Chinese Civil War and was a high school student in Nanjing during the first year of Chinese Communist rule. 26 years later, I made three annual visits to China as an American diplomat, uh, escorting congressional delegations uh, during the final years of the Cultural Revolution. And then I spent three years, first as deputy head of the U.S. Liaison Office, and then as the deputy chief of mission at the newly established U.S. Embassy. Five years after that, uh, after assignments in Bangkok and Singapore, I returned to Washington to spend three years as the deputy assistant secretary for China and two years as executive secretary of the State Department. And then 10 years after leaving Beijing, I returned for a four-year assignment as the American ambassador in Beijing. So I have personally experienced life in China while we were friendly allies against Japan, bitter enemies following the Korean War, hopeful partners in building a new bilateral relationship, and now newly estranged strategic rivals with the fate of the world increasingly dependent on decisions in Beijing and Washington. My parents were educational missionaries in China. I was born in the mid-1930s in Nanjing, where my father was a teacher at the University of Nanking. However, a year after I was born, my family returned to the United States for a two-year furlough, during which my father got a bachelor's degree from Princeton University. We returned to China for another seven years in 1938, as I mentioned, when I was three years old. My father's university had moved to temporary quarters in Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan province. That's where we spent the next seven years under wartime conditions in China. As a result, my earliest memories of China are of Japanese bombing raids and huddling with my family in dugouts. The university area where we were located sheltered a number of other refugee universities from China's coastal provinces. It was located across the river from the walled city of Chengdu and was not a prime target for the Japanese. Nevertheless, the bombs fell close enough to, shut, to shatter windows in our house and knock the floorboards loose. Although Chengdu was the provincial capital, the wartime capital of China was located in Chongqing, which was several hundred miles to the east. 
Chengdu had a population of about 450,000. Conditions were very primitive. There were no paved roads. Inside the city walls, the main streets, some of them, had cobblestones, but many were just mud streets. Rickshaws were the only means of public transportation. In the mountains, you could hire primitive sedan chairs, consisting of a cloth seat strung between two long bamboo poles with a carrier at each end. The house where we lived for most of our seven years had no heating and no plumbing. Our water came from a well in the courtyards, supplemented by a cistern that collected rainwater. Our toilets consisted of seats over large wooden buckets that had to be emptied into a cesspool. The electricity was sporadic and only available several times a week, so we depended heavily on kerosene lamps and candles. The climate of Chengdu is mild, with a light sprinkling of snow maybe every other year. The summers, however, were ferociously hot, so for two summers we spent a month living in Buddhist temples high in the mountains to escape the heat. Traveling to the temples was an adventure, because there were no bridges over the numerous canals. We traveled in coal burning, charcoal burning trucks that carried large boards in the back that were used to bridge the canals. Life in Chengdu changed enormously with the arrival in 1944 of a large contingent of U.S. Army Air Corps troops to staff four airfields that had been built around Chengdu for long-range bombing of Japan. These airfields became the targets for the Japanese nighttime bombing raids, so we no longer had to go to the air raid shelters or dugouts. The troops brought with them plentiful supplies of chocolate bars, chewing gum, comic books, and other luxuries that we had only dreamed of before. The foreign missionaries in Chengdu all opened their homes to young American troops who welcomed opportunities to enjoy some home cooking and family life. My parents let my brother and me ride out on the backs of motorcycles to the tent cities housing the troops to spend the night and watch the air operations. And we went on a hunting trip with the American troops to serve as interpreters uh, to find lodging in the mountains, which are the lower, the lower mountains of the Himalayas. Uh, and uh, that was very exciting for us. The one international school in Chengdu, run by the Canadians, had closed in 1941, just as I was ready to enter first grade. So for the next four years, my brother and I were homeschooled by missionary parents. Since these were educational missionaries, the quality of the schooling was first rate, and I had no difficulty fitting into American schools on my return. When the war in Europe ended in May 1945, it became possible to travel to the United States, which we did that summer for a three-year furlough, during which my father completed his PhD in philosophy from Princeton. We returned to Nanjing in September 1948, just in time for the final portion of the Chinese Civil War. My brother and I were in the Shanghai American School in May 1949, when the communist troops fought their way into the city, just as we were taking our final exam. A month later, we were able to get permission from the communist authorities to rejoin our parents in Nanjing. We arrived just in time for a small private July 4 reception by Ambassador Leighton Stewart for the tiny residual American community that was left in Nanjing. This was my first exposure to diplomatic life which was so radically different from that of missionaries. We spent the next year being homeschooled in Nanjing with the establishment of the People's Republic of China on October 1st, 1949. China's capital moved from Nanjing to Beijing. This precipitated a mass movement of foreign embassies to Beijing by those governments that recognized the new communist government, leaving even a smaller group of Americans in Nanjing. When the Korean War broke out at the end of June in 1950, my parents immediately decided to send my brother and me back to the United States 
and the two of us departed in July 1950. Our parents remained in Nanjing, only to be expelled nine months later after house arrest and a public trial. Oh, so, wow. I've had a lot of experiences in China, some Definitely. good and some not so good. <laughs> I imagine your childhood left quite the impression on you. How did, do you think that affected your future diplomatic career? The main advantage of having grown up in China is growing up with a sense that the Chinese are ordinary humans, uh, just, just like Americans. My parents' closest friends were Chinese. My playmates as a child uh, included missionary kids on the one hand and Chinese neighborhood children on the other hand. Uh, so I didn't have to go through the problem that some Americans who begin studying in China and sort of fall in love with Chinese culture and glamorize uh, uh, China in various ways. For me, uh, I was cautioned by my parents to watch out if I went on the university campus because students weren't entirely reliable in dealing with young children. Uh, and we had to be worried about thieves and, and other types of problems. So for me, Chinese were nice people when they were nice and they were dangerous people when they uh, were not nice. And uh, I think that was an advantage. Uh, because it means that I've, even when our relations are good or bad, to me, Chinese are just like other people. And therefore, as a diplomat, I had no difficulty adjusting to dealing with the Chinese. Is your childhood what made you interested in working in China? My experience in China got me interested in high school and in college in international relations. Mm. I did not join the Foreign Service uh, because I was interested in China. I joined the Foreign Service because I was interested in international relations and learning the art of dealing with foreign countries. Uh, within the Foreign Service, I was interested in getting assignments in China, but many of my assignments were not in China, and I was quite comfortable with that. So I don't think you should join the Foreign Service because of interest in a particular country, because you really have to be available for assignment wherever the, the service needs you to serve. Right. Thank you. Um, along those lines, uh, in 1971, you were posted at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. At this time, Henry Kissinger made his secret trip to China. Being in Moscow during that time, how did this trip affect the geopolitical relationship with the Soviet Union and with the Cold War? It was a world-shaking event. I can still remember standing at the news ticker in the American Embassy in Moscow, where I was serving at the time, um, and reading the unbelievable news that Dr. Kissinger I was in uh, Beijing. I was the second secretary in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow at that time, and I covered Soviet relations with uh, Asia. But the Russians had not permitted me to have access to any of their Asian specialists uh, until Dr. Kissinger showed up in Beijing. And then the, their Asian specialists began to seek me out to try to find out what was going on in U.S.-China relations. We used to also run into Chinese diplomats at diplomatic receptions in Moscow. But during my first two years there, uh, both of us were under instructions to have absolutely nothing to do with the other. But during my last year in Moscow, uh, we began to have conversations together. Uh, and much to the frustration of the other diplomats who were eavesdropping on our conversations, we talked in Chinese rather than in Russian or English. Uh, and they didn't know what was going on. But they were very limited contacts at that time. But the U.S. breakthrough to uh, China was really the turning point in the Cold War. Because I grew up during the Cold War and spent uh, 35 years uh, in the Foreign Service during the Cold War. And I remember 
the anxiety that we felt during the 50s and 60s over the fact that China had been lost, great portions of Europe had fallen into the Soviet Empire. Uh, in 1965, it was very close as to whether Indonesia was going to go communist. And we had fought wars in Korea and in Vietnam because of our concern about uh, expansion of the communist world. So while we were militarily very strong, psychologically, we were not self-confident. And I can remember the concern that a single socialist leaning professor in a university might infect a, the student body to believe in communism uh, during, the com during the McCarthy period. Those were the types of fears that the communists had infiltrated our society and that we were in danger of being subverted from within. And those fears vanished. We became, shall we say, psychologically self-confident after the breakthrough to China. And we continued, of course, to have a powerful economy and a powerful military to support our international uh, operations. So after Kissinger's trip, the following year, Nixon then went to China. And after his trip, liaison offices were set up in each capital uh, in the lead up to future normalization. So you were posted at the one in Beijing. What was it like serving during this unique in-between period? Well, it was very, uh, very difficult. Um, in, I, I was assigned there in 1978. And at that time, there was not a single hotel in China that met international standard. Beijing's airport was the equivalent of a tiny airport at a small U.S. city. It had no facilities. It was essentially a one-room affair with a few small rooms around it. Uh, getting to the airport was difficult because if you had to go out at night, it was a two-lane highway and Chinese would be playing cards under the street lights sitting in the middle of the highway. So you had to be very careful in going there. There were no international restaurants. Foreigners were not permitted into most Chinese restaurants. Uh, and we had to eat in certain specially designated restaurants that were used for partying by more senior uh, Chinese officials. We were only given access to the American department in the foreign ministry. Uh, because we didn't have diplomatic status, uh, we were limited. We couldn't call in other ministries. Our travel was very restricted. All of the consumer products that we needed to maintain an American standard of living in China had to be imported. That ranged from breakfast cereal to uh, Kleenex to toilet paper. Uh, None of that available was available locally or was not of a quality uh, that was suitable. So uh, that was the situation in 1978. Uh, very limited contacts with the Chinese. But on the other hand, China was going through a fascinating process of change. It was coming out of the Cultural Revolution. Right. It was clearly a political struggle going on over who the successor to Mao Zedong uh, was going to be, uh, and therefore being in Beijing would, seemed like a great privilege because we had been uh, denied any access to China for 20 years, and we had a lot of catch-up learning to do. Even dealing with all these extra struggles, you managed to work on negotiations towards normalization. What was that like? Well, the Nixon visit to Beijing created a problem for us because we hadn't informed the Japanese about what we were doing and they were deeply offended. So that when President Nixon visited China in 1972, Japan responded by establishing diplomatic relations with China in 1972. Uh, and other countries were establishing diplomatic relations with China as the, the Vietnam War en ended. Uh, with many of the Asian countries 
that had not recognized China uh, establishing diplomatic relations. But we had the Taiwan issue as a blocking factor. So we would have created a, a terrible situation for ourselves if we had opened the floodgates to international recognition of China while we ourselves couldn't complete the process of shifting our recognition of the government of China from the Republic of China in Taiwan that clearly only controlled the island of Taiwan, uh, while Beijing was the capital of the of mainland China, where most Chinese lived, and which was basically China. So we somehow had to complete the process of normalization. But the problem was that to do that, we had to figure out how to handle our relationship with Taiwan. The Chinese insisted that we had to break our diplomatic relationship with China. That's the one China policy, and that was a Chinese policy. Both the Republic of China and Beijing were equally insistent that you could only have official relations with one of them and not with both of them. I was in Taiwan, for example, in 1964, in the American embassy there, when the French uh, established diplomatic relations with Beijing, but didn't break relations with the Republic of China on Taiwan. The Republic of China responded by breaking relations with France. Uh, it was a maneuver by the French, but it illustrated the fact that both sides of the civil unresolved civil war were equally insistent that there was only one official government of China. And we recognized the losing side in the civil war, and we somehow had to correct that um, uh, problem. But the terms that the Chinese set were very difficult for us to meet. We had to break relations with a friendly government. We had to end a security treaty that we had with Taiwan after uh, the Korean War. And we had to remove our military forces from Taiwan. And quite frankly, we didn't want to meet those conditions. And for six years, three presidents tried to see if there was a better deal that was available, and it turned out there wasn't. And so President Carter decided that we would have to meet those conditions, but we were not prepared to have Taiwan left simply as a walkover for China to deal with. So we insisted on continuing our arms sales to Taiwan, even after we broke relations with them. So these were the issues that we had to deal with in the normalization talks. And when we began the talks, we had no assurance that we were going to be successful in our minimum conditions. Uh, we were prepared to meet the Chinese minimum conditions, but we didn't know whether they would agree to our minimum conditions. So there was a lot of tenseness in the talks. The additional complicating factor was Secrecy was absolutely necessary. We had told the top members of Congress before we began the negotiations that what our, we were prepared to meet the three terms, great mm -hmm. relations with Taiwan uh, and the security treaty and uh, we remove our military forces. And they had said, you're doing the right thing, but we will criticize you. In other words, they didn't want to be seen as approving something that they knew the United States had to do in order to protect our position in Asia and, frankly, in the world. So if news of the talks had come out, we would have had a raft of criticism right. from people who actually thought we were doing the right thing. But to do it, we had to do it in secrecy. And this meant that only a handful of people in Washington uh, were aware uh, uh, that we were engaged in the negotiations. And Ambassador in Woodcock, uh, I was his advisor in the negotiations, had to do this behind the backs of our fellow American employees in the uh, liaison office. So it was an awkward situation. The Chinese would not handle the talks the way we wanted them to. We had broken the issues into four different sections, and we wanted to present one section 
and get the Chinese response and then deal with the second section and get the Chinese response. They said, no, you've got to lay your cards on the table. So over a period of four months, we patiently outlined what our uh, position was on continuing unofficial relations with, China, with Taiwan uh, in, in other respects. And the big issue that we knew was the most troublesome one had to do with selling arms to Taiwan. But we covered that also in a way that Washington had approved, which dealt with it very diplomatically, but was clear. And after we had completed our presentation, when we were invited to the next meeting where we were expected to get the Chinese response, we were told that the foreign minister was not available, that he was sick, and that we would meet with the deputy foreign minister. And we've been conducting all the negotiations with the foreign minister. So what did that mean? Did that mean that they were sending a signal to us that they were not satisfied with our position and therefore downgrading the talks? Or did it mean that the foreign minister was really sick and we had to meet with the deputy foreign minister? So we consulted with Washington and mutually agreed that we should go ahead with the session. And the session went well. They gave a positive response to what we had laid on the table and told us that uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping would want to meet with us soon, which then got awkward, uh, awkward because I was planning a vacation with my wife in southern China and Ambassador Woodcock didn't want me to leave Beijing until we knew when the meeting with Deng Xiaoping would be. So we waited about 10 days and then we had a, a series of, of five meetings with Deng Xiaoping over the course of three days uh, in which we wrapped up uh, the negotiations. Uh, but when we wrapped them up, Washington came back to us and said, are you absolutely certain that Deng Xiaoping understands that we will be continuing arms sales to Taiwan? And that was the, the core issue. And Ambassador Woodcock and I consulted with each other and both agreed that they should have interpreted our language the way it was intended to be interpreted, but we couldn't exclude the possibility that Deng Xiaoping had chosen to read into it what he wanted it to be rather than what we wanted it to be. So we gave that opinion back to Washington and they said, go in and see Deng again and tell him we are, tend to continue arms sales to Taiwan after normalization. And uh, that was a very tough meeting. Uh, Deng was outraged. He had not understood that at all. Uh, and everything seemed to be handling in the balance. And Finally, he calmed down and said to Woodcock, what should we do? And Woodcock said, we can, can't solve this issue here. We can handle it better if we have a diplomatic relationship than if we don't have a diplomatic relationship. And Deng said, okay. And that's how we produced the agreement to establish diplomatic relations. It was a tough period. And we also then had the problem of dealing with our staff Mm -hmm. who quite understandably resented the fact that something of earth-shattering importance had been done behind their backs that was uh, very relevant to them. Uh, but they were professionals and they understood. Uh, and I understood their attitudes because that's what the way I would have felt if I had been in their shoes. And then Woodcock stayed on as the first official ambassador, correct? That's correct. He was the best negotiator I've ever seen in operation. He, of course, had been the former, he was the former head of the United Auto Workers mm -hmm. and had carried very big, important negotiations with each of the three uh, major U.S. auto companies. Uh, and I also learned from the experience that it is very helpful if your negotiator has earned the respect of the other side. And Woodcock had earned the respect of the Chinese side. Uh, and it made a difference. 
People don't like to reach agreement on a difficult issue with people they dislike. Mm. Because then that somehow gives credit to the other side for having reached the agreement. And uh, that that's the way humans are. The personal feelings can get in the way of important issues. So you would later return to Beijing as ambassador from 1991 to 1995. Um, after having played an active role in normalization, when you returned, it was also during another pivotal period. So this was the aftermath of the 1989 Tiananmen crackdown and the oncoming collapse of the Soviet Union. How did these events affect U.S.-China relations and your role as ambassador? Enormously, enormously. Uh, the first big problem was the lingering effect of the crackdown in Tiananmen Square uh, in June of 1989. Right. Uh, it had essentially uh, destroyed support for a constructive relationship with China in the United States. President Bush, the first President Bush, had been head of the liaison office in Beijing and from 1974 to 75. And he was proud of the fact that he had become president of the United States and he looked forward to having a closer relationship with China. But Tiananmen made that impossible. Uh, he was untouchable on foreign policy issues because he had been our representative of the United Nations and had one of the best drafts of international relations of any of our post-World War II presidents, Eisenhower, Nixon, uh, and uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, are the presidents who really had strong uh, backgrounds in foreign affairs and national security affairs. Uh, so we had a big problem on our hands. He didn't want to have the relationship destroyed, but the only issue on which he was vulnerable uh, was China. And the Democrats leapt on the China issue as a way of beating up on President Bush. So that made it difficult to be trying to manage the U.S. relationship with China because the president was on the defensive. He wanted to protect the relationship, but at the same time he recognized that U.S. attitudes on China had turned very negative. So that was the first problem that affected my own role as the new ambassador to Beijing. Uh, the second problem was that our breakthrough to China had been made possible by our respective concerns about the Soviet threat. And from 1971 until 1989, uh, we had essentially based our new relationship on our common concerns about dealing with the Soviet Union. And all of a sudden, in 1970, in 1991, uh, the Soviet Union was collapsing. In fact, I was delivering my uh, credentials as ambassador to the president of China when the uh, demonstrations, uh, uh, the coup was taking place in Moscow against Gorbachev in August of 1991. Uh, and we were both discussing that situation uh, based on CNN news reports. <laughs> We've both been watching CNN, and that was the basis for the information we had available. But the problem was that with the Soviet threat gone, the underpinning for the, the strategic rationale for the relationship was no longer there. So you had a hostile change in attitudes toward China in the United States, and you had a removal of the strategic underpinning for the relationship. So Americans, and that includes government officials, didn't know what type of relationship we wanted with China. And this made it very awkward for an ambassador in Beijing uh, because American officials were afraid to visit China because they were afraid that they would be criticized for going there. Uh, and therefore, it we had to move very cautiously in order to try to start rebuilding the relationship on a different basis than the Soviet threat. 
and that took time, and I was there at the early stages of this process. Uh, in fact, by the end of the second Clinton term, we had begun to recognize that we had to deal with China as an emerging major country, and we certainly couldn't simply look at it through a human rights lens or a, an economic lens, that we had to deal with it as the major country it was becoming. But that took time, and we didn't really cross that barrier until uh, after I had left Beijing. What would you say was the biggest challenge you, you faced during your tenure? Well, it, it was it was dealing with the problem that I've just described. A second problem I had was that I had been appointed by President uh, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, a Republican, and President Clinton, uh, a Democrat, decided to keep me on as ambassador. In fact, I'm the only American ambassador to China that has uh, served under both a Democratic and a Republican administration. Oh, wow. Uh, fortunately, the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia uh, in the Clinton administration uh, had been the ambassador in China when I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary handling China in Washington. And I had given him superb support, uh, and he was grateful for that, and he gave me superb uh, support uh, in Beijing. But the Clinton administration came in with a decision to use human rights as the lens for dealing with China. And uh, the first major démarche that I had to carry out in Beijing was the linking of uh, human rights to uh, most favored nation treatment for China. And uh, that was a very difficult démarche to carry out. Uh, first of all, I thought that the linkage was not the right way to handle the problem. Uh, but as the representative of the Clinton administration, I had to make it work. And the question was, how do you make that presentation without getting it thrown out of the office? Uh, but I was able to get over that hurdle. And in fact, the Chinese agreed to address all of the seven areas where we wanted improvements in human rights. Uh, and my strategy was to see if we could get some progress in each of the areas. And then we would argue with Washington whether we could call it fundamental progress. Because what we were demanding was fundamental improvements in seven areas of human rights in one year. Which is absurd on the face of it, but nevertheless, that's what they wanted. Well, the Chinese agreed to talk. But then the problem was with Washington, because I could not get instructions from Washington on what we would do if the Chinese were prepared to do certain things in the particular areas of human rights we were concerned about. Well, you can't negotiate if you can't convey to the other side what they will get if they do what you want them to do. And that continued for nine months. And I had one year in which to try to wrap up these negotiations, and I couldn't get instructions that were usable with the Chinese side. So it was a very frustrating period, and I was dealing with a new administration, uh, and I, I had known all the top officials in the Bush administration. I only knew some of them in the uh, Clinton administration, and so I had to, I had to walk carefully. Uh, and one of the notable things during the first year of the Clinton administration was that the situation in China had turned around after the Tiananmen events. The Tiananmen events had enabled conservatives in China to essentially halt the reform and openness policies that Deng Xiaoping had started. And China had reverted to a much more uh, closed system. But after the 14th Party Congress in the fall of 1992, the last year of the Bush administration, they had thrown out the conservatives and had gone back heavily to reform and openness policies. 
and the American business community immediately notified, noticed that. And so during 1993, CEOs of big American companies were flocking into China. And because of concerns about the political relationship, they all met with me. And they were all stunned to find when they came to China that the situation was more favorable than it was being reported in the United States. And I discovered that American tourists were reacting the same way and that American China specialists who came to China were also surprised to find that after Tiananmen, China had recovered and was much more open and outward looking than it was being reported in the United States. So at the end of 1993, I gave an interview to the New York Times in which I did not defend China's human rights practices, which were still unsatisfactory from an American standpoint. But I did talk about the improvements in China in terms of standard living, in terms of economic development, in terms of freedom of movement, etc. And New York Times carried it on the front page, and I ran us into a firestorm of criticism from Washington. Uh, the administration was upset, and Congress was upset uh, that I had talked this way. Uh, and it looked like I might be withdrawn. And uh, that's where the assistant secretary proved helpful. Because I talked to him and I said, if Washington wasn't prepared to back me up on this, they had the transcript of my interview. I had not, I had defended our human rights approach. But I had also spoken accurately about what the situation in China was. And if they weren't prepared to back me up, I said they should take me out. And within three hours, Washington issued a statement expressing confidence in me. And that is thanks to the assistant secretary who orchestrated that. Uh, the interesting thing about that episode is I privately received three letters from cabinet members of the Clinton administration praising me for having spoken out the way I did. Uh, in other words, they recognized that the way that we were dealing with China and the United States was distorting the reality of what was actually happening in China. So those are the types of problems that I ran into uh, uh, as ambassador in China. But generally, I found that while you couldn't move easily from here to there, if you approached it gradually, uh, that you could make progress in the right direction. Um, and in fact, that's what that's what took place. Do you have any insights from serving under two different administrations and having to make those types of adjustments? When you fought, serve in the Foreign Service, you work for the United States. And it doesn't matter who is in office. You want whatever president is in office to be successful, and you want that president to be helpful in advancing the interests of the United States. And I never encountered a, in, in the near half century that I was in the Foreign Service, I never encountered a civil servant or a Foreign Service officer who didn't basically have that attitude. So this suspicion of civil servants on the part of political appointees in Washington, in my experience, is totally unjustified. And in well-run embassies, and in ones that I've served in, and in ones that I've headed, one of the most uh, heartwarming features is that you can have multiple agencies of the UN go of the U.S. government pulling together as one team to try to advance U.S. interests without any of the departmental and petty rivalries that take place in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I found it was that way in China in spades. Uh, as an example, uh, the political section worked hand in hand with our defense attache office uh, 
to produce an intelligence analysis that was so good that it was incorporated word for word. Portions of it were incorporated word for word into a national intelligence estimate in Washington. Uh, you don't get that type of cooperation in Washington, and yet we were able to produce that in our overseas missions. So we are accustomed to working for whoever's in charge in Washington. So that does not, you can have your own personal views on politics, but it doesn't spill over into your desire to see the American, uh, America successful. And that is the motivating inspiration for our civil servants abroad and frankly in Washington. Uh, at least that's been in my experience. So that wasn't a problem. But you do have a problem because you have to be <laughs> as skillful a diplomat in dealing with Washington as you do in dealing with your own, with, with the host government where you're serving uh, uh, as ambassador. Uh, there are personalities in Washington. I knew all of the top officials in the Bush administration. I didn't know them in the uh, Clinton administration. So you have to be careful how you address issues uh, and you have to maintain support because diplomacy is a competitive business. You have to always remember that the other country has their ambassador in Washington. And if that ambassador is more successful in gaining the confidence of your government as a channel for communication with his government, then you're going to be cut out. And so you have to be sure that you retain the confidence of your own government as the channel for communications with the foreign government to which you're accredited. And that takes work. And it's one reason why generally you have to visit Washington periodically in order to renew acquaintances there. And it's also useful to go up and talk to people in Congress and get their attitudes so you can be armed to know better how to represent the administration successfully in dealing with the country where you're accredited. What has your career taught you about the role of diplomacy in foreign affairs? Diplomacy is essentially the way to try to advance the national interest without fighting wars. And we have learned, especially I would say over the last 20 years, that there are many major international issues to which there is no military solution. We were 20 years in Afghanistan trying to create a sustainable governmental and security structure there, and we were unable to do so. And the way that Iraq is developed is not the way that we expected or wanted it to develop. So that's what can happen if you try to use military power in order to accomplish what should be accomplished through diplomacy. The second aspect is, I think a lot of us think that the right way to deal with the outside world is to have a successful, a skillful diplomacy backed up by credible military power. But the military power should be in the back, not in the front. And we sometimes get that backwards. And I think that's one of the deficiencies in America's diplomacy. Because when you have sufficient military power to be able to alter an outcome if your diplomacy fails, then there's a tendency to resort to it anyway. Other countries have to depend on their diplomacy in order to advance their national interests. We have two options. One is diplomacy and one is military power. And too often, we skimp the diplomacy and use the military power to do what, to get what we want. But we discover that we can't get with our what we want if we use military power where it's not the appropriate instrument. 
for accomplishing our national goals. So in my experience, we are capable of stunningly effective diplomacy when we put our mind to it. And we have the professional diplomats who have the experience, the language skills, and the uh, desire to improve our relations with foreign countries and to overcome difficult issues in the process. Uh, but we don't always use those people as effectively as we could. I find it stunning that our military, which is the best in the world, is the only entirely professional part of the U.S. government. We don't have political appointees as generals. We're just mourning the passage of Colin Powell, who is an example of a senior military officer who had the, the professionalism and the humanity and the integrity to gain the respect and confidence of all of our senior leaders, whether in Democratic or Republican administrations. And so I consider Colin Powell to be an example of the best in our military. And it's a totally professional service from top to bottom. And our diplom diplomatic uh, uh, service is not because 40% of the top positions do not go to our general equivalents. They go to political appointees. And the political appointees come in and some are good and some are bad. But whatever they learn goes back to the private sector instead of remaining in the government to bulk up our experience in knowing how to address foreign policy issues successfully. Along those lines, what advice do you have for today's diplomats? First, you have to be able to see the other side of issues. If you can't put yourself in the shoes of the other side without being captured by their viewpoint, but to understand why they are looking at the issue the way they look at it, then your effectiveness is going to be eroded. Secondly, you have to constantly reflect on how your own country's behavior is influencing the behavior of others. This is where our intelligence community is weakest. And the reason is because if they explain bad behavior by another country as that country's reaction to a bad policy by our country, then our political leaders all get mad and blame the intelligence community. So the intelligence community is not good in identifying where foreign behavior is the product or a reaction to U.S. behavior. And for diplomats, you have to be able to make that distinction. Because in many cases, the foreign country is reacting to what you're doing and not simply doing something wicked on its own. Sometimes they do something wicked, so you have to also recognize that. But if we're doing something which is adversely affecting their interests, they will then do something in response. And if we then blame that on the fact that they're wicked, they were not understanding the problem. And we see that at work in our relationship with China over Taiwan at the moment, where China is doing some things that we don't like, but they are responding to the things that we're doing that China doesn't like. And the question is, how do you get that dynamic under control? And being able to control that dynamic is vitally important if we're not going to get our relationship pushed in the wrong direction. So uh, the last point I would make is 
we have to recognize that the world is changing and it's becoming multipolar again. We have been the sole superpower in a unipolar world for, what, two decades, three decades. And we have discovered that, in fact, there is no such thing as the sole superpower. Because during that period of dominance, which is highly unusual in the world, we weren't able to use our military power effectively in order to accomplish our purposes. Uh, and I don't think the country, the world, is subject to being dominated by a sole superpower. I don't think that China aspires to be a sole superpower. What China aspires to is to be one of the leading countries of the world, and therefore a country that has a right to claim a place at the table when major decisions are made on international issues that affect China's interests. And that hasn't always been the case. Uh, but many Americans don't think that. But I think that if they don't recognize that dynamic, then we'll have a distorted view of how to deal with, with the world. Given your experience, how have you seen the U.S.-China relationship change over the years? Oh, boy. It's gone through what I call four phases. The first phase was when we wanted to deal with the Soviet threat, and we needed China on our side to do that effectively. That extended from 1971 until 1989. From 89 to... 92, the relationship basically went on hold. China was going through a domestic crisis. They had the Tiananmen demonstrations. They had the crackdown. They had the collapse of the Soviet Union. And they had an internal struggle over um, economic policy. And... Uh, it wasn't clear how they were going to come out of that. But as I mentioned at the 14th Party Congress in the fall of 1992, they reaffirmed the reform and openness policies. And then we had the period when the United States, which went through this period of uncertainty of what we wanted from China. Finally, we became conscious of the fact that we had to deal with China as a major country. And that process set in during the Clinton administration and extended into the Bush administration. And then we had the financial crisis in 2008, which created the impression that Europe and the United States were declining powers. And we had China's sudden catch up with us in GDP growth uh, much faster than we had anticipated. And uh, we essentially had a blow to our own self-confidence. And we had the emergence of domestic uh, divisions within the United States that our political system was having difficulty managing. So it's this um, dynamic of what seems to be a successfully rising, not very attractive China from the standpoint of American values. And a United States that had been the sole superpower, but now is having difficulty not only being successful in our international position, but also being successful in managing our own domestic affairs. And that's created a very troublesome dynamic in the U.S.-China relationship, where we are inclined to see China as a hostile power because it is being more successful than we are in dealing with economic development and, uh, and maintaining domestic stability. So uh, I think that's an exaggeration. I would much rather have the American hand to play in the world than the Chinese hand to play in the world. I think China still has a fundamental built-in contradiction between a modernized economy to a certain degree and a modernized population, thanks to decades of sending people abroad to study 
and being open to the outside world, and they haven't modernized their political system, which still is a monopoly of power in the hands of the Communist Party, which is no different from having a monopoly of power for a king and a nobility, if you will. Uh, that's a pre-modern form of governance, and modern countries have moved away from that, and China hasn't. So I think China has its own domestic problems to deal with, and we don't know how to tell China what, how it should handle that. Uh, but we also don't understand that we should stop giving the advice to other countries on how to run the, their domestic affairs. So I see China as a real challenge for us, but it's a manageable challenge. And in my judgment, there is no problem in the U.S.-China relationship that cannot be handled, managed through skillful diplomacy. And there is no issue in U.S.-China relations that can be successfully managed through military power. So diplomacy is the way to deal with China, and it has to be diplomacy that is based on a realistic understanding of both our own strengths and weaknesses and the strengths and weaknesses of China. Before we conclude, do you have any ad final advice for those working on U.S.-China policy, or is there anything else we haven't covered that you would like to share? Uh, there is. Uh, I'd just like to make a few comments about Taiwan. Sure. Because Taiwan remains the single most important issue in the U.S.-China relationship. Taiwan has been self-governing under a multi-party democracy for over 20 years now. It is in the U.S. interest to help sustain Taiwan's self-governing status for as long as possible. There are no peaceful avenues for resolving the Taiwan issues, which is basically its international status, uh, under present circumstances and for the foreseeable future. And our policy has always been committed to find a peaceful resolution to its status. So maintaining the status quo is preferable to any current alternatives. And this should be sustained for as long as possible in the hope that better alternatives will emerge in the future. But for the moment, we don't have a stable status quo. Beijing's military pressure on Taiwan is increasing both to keep it within a one China framework and to cow it into accepting unification as the only viable outcome. Unless the status quo could be stabilized, chances for a military conflict are likely to increase. The only viable way to stabilize the status quo is to increase China's confidence in the American one China policy, which is the stable framework within which Taiwan has been able to develop so dramatically successfully over the last 40 years. It now has a per capita income equivalent to that of Canada. Uh, and when I served in Taiwan back in the 50s and 60s, it was just moving from rice growing to pineapple canning, and then it moved on into electronics and on up the, um, uh, the progression. It's been a dramatic success story and it was made possible by the stability provided by the U.S. One China policy and our com commitment to peaceful resolution. And frankly, uh, we have to keep Taiwan strong enough to discourage PRC military adventurism. That also needs to be part of it. But at the moment, our policy is not giving enough attention to trying to lower the tensions over the Taiwan issue in the Taiwan Strait. And I think that this is not in Taiwan's interest and it's not in the American interest to have a status quo, which in the eyes of Beijing is moving in the wrong direction and that they are prepared to use military force to halt that movement. And that's a dangerous situation. And I think there's something we can do about it and we're not doing it yet. So this is the big challenge, it seems to me, in the U.S. relationship with China. Thank you. That's all the time we have today. Ambassador Roy, thank you so much for sharing your memories and insights with us.
To everyone watching, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time on China Forum. Thank you. Enjoy being with you.